All right, guys, let's make a room. This is just going to be a quick off-the-cuff thing. Uh, what do we do first? Well, my first thing that I go to is what kind of room? So ideation is very important, and it's just the function of trying to see every possible thing uh, po uh, you can and just know what's out there that you could do, therefore figure out what um, your idea or your unique spin on it is. I use Bing because... Uh, it's like a million times better than Google Images these days. And I'm also going to cheat. I'm going to use this little thing. Uh, I think this is uh, Download Images. This is a little Chrome plugin. You can find Download All Images. And this is going to uh, download this crazy, gigantic zip of every single thing in there. It's going to be all sorts of little previews. Let's extract it to here. And... Hey, would you look at that? Millions and millions of boys' bedrooms. Of course, this is not a very pleasant way to look at it, especially if you're trying to do digital illustration. But it is cool that you can see them all. So I prefer to use Pure Ref, which is this little program here. Pure Ref is really neat, and you can go to the settings and find all the stuff. Um, but it's just basically um, an offline uh, mood board thing. And I like it because you can use it in a lot of ways that are a little more uh, synchronized with other programs so you can have it so that it always floats on top i'm going to then sort by size i'm just going to go until like around here that's probably enough and you know it's just a very powerful feeling um what's the term It's, it's almost like, uh, you know, Minority Report when he's like, psh, Exploded View. And you can see, like, lots and lots of things. I figured I'd go for, like, uh, a nasty teenage boy room, you know, hidden bongs and stuff under here. Some sort of tongue-in-cheek, low-brow humor. Comics, dirty underpants, cool music posters, stuff like that. And a lot of that uh, becomes a really great way to do... Lots and lots of things. So, next up, how do we set up a grid? Well, um, there's a couple of things that we should talk about with perspective. First off, given a one point perspective, that is going to traditionally be directly in the center here. I don't know what this grid is pixels duh so the thing about um, one point perspective is one point perspective uh, is explicitly with a vanishing point right here in the center and it's important to know that because a lot of times like people will crop a photo like they'll take a photo and they're like oh there's uh, you know, some jerk over here that I don't like, I'll crop it over here. That can end up being a wrong photo in that, you know, wrong in a certain sense, in that there's a perspective point out here, and um, everything is vanishing evenly towards it, and yet the crop means it's not accurate. Because um, the alternative would be if you had two-point perspective. Now let's talk about two-point perspective. If you had... I'm just going to eyeball this. Um, so if you had um, your perspective points directly on the canvas here, that is the equivalent of a 16 millimeter lens. How to put this? Um, let's just draw like an example of that. So imagine this is you here. There's your body, and here's your head, and you're looking out. Pardon my walk, I'm tilt. No. So you're looking out, and imagine you hold your arms out in like a silly way, so that your your body's at like this 45 degree angle, right? 45 degrees. That would be something where, um, in the same way that um, given parallel lines, lines that are parallel to your line of sight, even if they're way over here. Um, those all vanish at the vanishing point, way off in the distance. Uh, when we say two-point perspective, what we are envisioning here is that 
lines at a 45 degree angle to your body or to 45 degrees to your cyclops blast of the principal vanishing point will vanish over here and similarly line if this is at a 45 degree angle there anything else even if it's like way over here is also going to vanish at that point now the thing is um, that is not necessarily what we see so um, when i say 45 degrees what are we interpreting here on one hand you might envision this as a picture plane and that 45 degree angle is such that uh, the vanishing points are right here on the edge Boo. now that given a camera imagine we're using this with a camera as a metaphor so here's the camera body and here is your lens and inside of here is a camera plate or an image sensor and that image sensor you might have heard something like 35 millimeters that refers to the sensor size so this sensor is 35 uh, millimeters across here so when you see on a camera lens it'll have a millimeter that is in relation to that so when we have something like a 16 millimeter lens that's like the equivalent of um you know half as much right just about so 36 millimeter what is that 34 33 it's close enough um and so when you have that halfway thing a 16 millimeter lens ends up being where you would have these vanishing points directly on the vanishing point and you know now suddenly all these things vanish towards it of course that's not how uh, we see things because of a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't know why I'm doing this on this tiny little thing. Uh, you have something known as a crop factor in which the camera housing actually attaches to this camera body in some way. And that can take up enough space that you have this little crop factor where this, this stuff is no longer usable. So uh, too bad. The other thing you have happen is that usually you don't use a 16 millimeter lens. The standardized lens, like if you buy a nifty 50, is 50 millimeters. Um, and so um, if you imagine this as a ratio, um, a camera lens that was um, 35 millimeters long, in other words, uh, here's rectangle one, here is that 16 millimeter lens, that's the distance. At this point, we have this 45 degree angles, right? So what do we have when we have a 35 degree angle? Given that same size of picture plane, you start getting a smaller range. So what if we had a 300 millimeter lens? 300 millimeters. You start having that really, really crazy wide angle. And so that's something to know. So like um, if I have these vanishing points for a two point perspective right here on the grid, it's just important to know that um, this is very rare. And it's one of the reasons that like when you see like aggressive two point perspective, number one, it's pleasant to me when I see that because that means they had to have drawn it because it's almost never going to work as a photo reference. Um, so on, on one hand, that could be pleasant. On the other hand, you might end up in this scenario where um, it doesn't feel realistic because that's not how we see reality. So usually what you end up with is some sort of let me switch to a rectangle, let's do pixels. Um, you usually have some sort of crop where it's like it's closer to that, right? Which probably want it to be centered so like that ends up being the crop and like you can just plan that in if you really care about it again this feels like you know how do you bake a pie first you must invent the universe uh, but i think it's important to understand these ground rules um, to understand why your picture might look wrong so like let's go back to our pure document um, a lot of things like this bed 
are going to be like this photo here is two point perspective but if you follow this line here like if you followed this line here and this line here and this line here their vanishing point would actually probably be slightly off grid like over here I think is where it would be um, in other words probably something like a 24 millimeter lens um, again doesn't sound very artistic so far right so let's get into like actually solving some of these problems I actually am going to do this um, as a uh, 45 degree angle drawing and I'm actually going to use these two point perspective uh, points because I can always crop it later or scale it up and I actually really enjoy these um, as something so I'm using shift click to just like draw a bunch of lines doesn't matter where they're going and this is something that's very pleasing to do just to give yourself a cheat like there's no rules here right just give yourself infinite lines just so it feels good again there is a cheaper way to do this in Photoshop I believe what it is is let's see. what I need to do is switch to the polygon tool change it to star mode I want this to be yeah sure will you I like light red I want this to be 99 percent and how many sides let's go with oh uh, sure 99 so given a ruler that represents our horizon line and I like to usually put my horizon line either a little low which would be like if we are a mouse or in this case maybe a little brother who snuck into your kids room or maybe you're like on the floor looking under the bed or a high angle which might be a parent staring down at this filthy teenager's room uh, I'll go like maybe right, a little lower so maybe somebody sitting in a chair and therefore somebody standing would be a little higher up than you and now I go we And I have this set, I'm using the shape tool set to pixels, so it automatically pops in there. Oh, wee. Cool. Now, what I think of with interiors is oftentimes like, where is my defining starting edge? So uh, if this was a product, a lot of times that would be a foreground edge. Like if I was doing this as a spaceship, maybe like that's my foreground edge. And now I have lines going back and this way. Um, instead, this is going to be like a background edge. And by the way, note that this is not accurate perspective here. So this currently, basically this gives you like a guide, but it doesn't actually divide this evenly. Should we get into that problem? Oh, sure. Why not? So given a one point perspective, Let's just have this actually you know, here. Image. I'm going to rotate this 180 degrees so that we're having a downward view because I think like a chessboard is probably the ideal way to explain this. So let's say we had a chessboard here. The first thing you need to have is just a starting line. Um, I'm actually going to do this as two separate lines so that I can have some semblance of their exact center there just a way that I can tell them apart now that color shift is kind of important because Uh, I'm going to use, I don't have this centered, so I could actually take that line and make it directly in the center, 
And that would solve a lot of my problems. But I'm trying to cause problems. So given this chessboard, I'm going to draw the side edges of it. They're now going all the way back forever at infinitum. Now how do I find the back edge? The front edge was really easy because this chessboard is oriented directly towards us. And the sides were really easy. Um, I could actually even start to make, oh no. So let's say we have those vanishing points for two point perspective directly on the side here. Now we end up dealing with some of the math of perspective. So given a perfect square, beep, boop, 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 you have a couple of things that happen. Number one, every side is identical in length. So let's so this side is 16, this side is 16, this side is 16, this side is 16. 16 what? 16 inches, 16 feet, who knows? doesn't really matter. This gives us a couple of help, helpful things. For instance, if I cut the diagonals of this on a square, you will get the exact center point. And we also know a couple things. So for instance, if this is... Uh, 40, uh, 90 degrees, a 90 degree angle. On a perfect square, we know that these are both 45 degree angles. If this was a rectangle, this would still give us the direct center of the rectangle, but these angles would be different. Number two, we can now click and drag these out. And what have I done by drawing parallel lines? Well, first off, what are they parallel to? They're parallel to these other edges of this square. Welcome to Oscar's art lessons, where I ruin all the fun with math. So this gives us a couple things. Because this is the direct center, um, blah, 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 Pythagoras, therefore, this side is exactly 8. This side is exactly 8. This is exactly 8. This is exactly 8. And also, this is directly 45 degree 8. Now, what else do we have? We now have a square within a square, which means that if we cut this diagonal, we have a new center point, which can also be cut. Now, again, this is if we were doing this in a two-dimensional uh, fashion, which therefore limits a lot of the problems that you would otherwise have. So now I know that if this total length is 8, both of these are 4, and so on and so forth. Therefore, this little side here is 2. Oh, running out of pixels. Now, what else do we start to see here? Well, you might notice something, which is these are parallel lines in diagonals. On a perfect square, all of these lines are parallel to each other. And in that sense, what do they converge at? Ding, 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 ding. They're going to land at that secondary vanishing point. In other words, if I have a principal vanishing point, which by the definition of a principal vanishing point for one point perspective, it must be in the direct center. And I have these secondary vanishing points, which for, or diagonal vanishing points if you prefer, which based on the laws of mathematics must be equidistant from the center. I can now click there to there, and I got this little intersection here. And that intersection is going to be mathematically identical to the two-dimensional problem that I have over here. And same over here. So if I click there and here, I now have two cuts in the back. And this is going to be exactly mathematically perfect as a square. So if you could see the principal vanishing point and the diagonal vanishing points, this would be a perfect square. It's not a rectangle, but it's important to understand the difference between this and a rectangle. So for instance, like what if we uh, then, so at this point, like I can erase a lot of this. So what if I, I just had a little, 
little panic attack. Am I even recording? So what if I had um, just any random thing? Why can't I just do this without thinking about all this math? Well, it's very easy to just um, take, like you could take this uh, inner stuff. And what if I took all this diagonal stuff out? I could technically cut this at any point and it will technically be a rectangle. I could cut it there. I could cut it here. I could cut it here. But we're trying to use perspective for depth. And therefore, none of those are accurate uh, because we're just arbitrarily choosing them. Therefore, it could be a rectangle of any length. And that's OK sometimes. Like, you know, if you have a repeating fence post, you know, who gives a fuck if it's, uh, you know, 10 feet or 11 feet away? But if you're trying to be like mathematically perfect, it's nice to know this stuff. So given that, let's just continue with this chessboard problem. So I could now use this to I'm gonna switch to the line tool. And I want this as pixels. Let's up the opacity. Also, I'm gonna get rid of some of this stuff. Also, where, oh, where is my hard round brush? So, line tool, where were you? So, I could draw it like that. And you'll note that because I have this diagonal here, or this um, center cut, that also gives me a center point that I can draw a parallel line here. Because any line that's parallel to this will look parallel to the horizon as it goes back. So all these lines, just drawing some random lines here, they're parallel to this chessboard. Doesn't matter where they are. So having done that, I now have a couple of ways I can approach this. And I'll do it. One way on, on this side and another way on the other. I just think this chess board is such a useful way to like think about it when you're when you're getting started. Plus I was varsity chess. I gotta represent for that reason. West Valley Rams, woo. So uh, method number one, we could, like we did on the two-dimensional square, just keep cutting diagonals. I'm going to do this the smart way. Which is... So now I could, having cut that diagonal, just drag this line out. By the way, I want this weight. Boop. And delete. And now I have a number of things. I have this back edge here. So now I've broken this from a half into eighths. And now I could do the same thing again, where I take this line, I could cut this diagonal. And now on a new layer, I'm going to go boop. No. And now I'm starting to get to the point where I have everything necessary to start calling it quits on this uh, chessboard, right? I have a diagonal here. By the way, I'm holding shift on the pen tool sometimes for some of these things. And then I'm also using the line tool to sometimes just automatically get it. So this one, I'll hold shift. Now look at that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And now you could start making it. God, Photoshop's paint bucket is awful. 
instant you try a different program, you're going to be like, wow, Oscar was 100% right there. Boop, boop, boop. A perspective chessboard in exactly perfect square format. Now, here's the other way you can do this, which is, uh, you know, I have this line here. And it goes from here to here. I could instead just take this line and measure it. So let's pin this to the side. Pin this to the side, and I'm going to cut the width in half. And now I have this point where basically I can just measure this line. And if this line is a specific measurement, you could break it up into those quadrants. I don't feel like measuring. So if you do that, then it's real easy to just take this line tool here and go beep boo. And would you look at that? Every single chunk of this has some intersection with the diagonal. So you can see how this is sometimes a little more measurement oriented rather than logic oriented, and that can be a real time saver. And so on and so forth. You get the idea. The completionist in me wants to do it. I gotta finish it. Now, what is still wrong here? This is actually still a very inaccurate chessboard because when you play chess, white is on the right and queen takes the color. I drew the white on the black square. So the last thing we have to do is merge all this down into one layer because layers are dumb. Just use one layer for everything. And having done that, select all, right click, flip horizontal. Much better. Now, what's the next thing? My text is upside down and backwards now, so I can't read it. But whatever, reading is dumb. You should draw more. So how do we actually like use some of this stuff in like an applicable way? Um, well, let's get to the next thing, which I think was we talked about ideation. We talked about grids. What about cheap tricks? All right, let's do a cheap trick. Suppose, after all that work, you're like, this is awful. I don't want to do this anymore. Oh, no. Hold on one sec. So cheap trick number one. You know, some rudimentary skills in 3D gets you really, really far. So this is a two-meter tall person. I believe Chewbacca is two meters tall. The average human is about 1.8. So let's scale it down a little bit. Maybe just like that. So this is your person, right? And then what if you just make a floor plan in 3D that kind of fits? You know, you don't have to have excellent modeling skills to actually get everything you need for kind of a convincing home layout. So what if this is the kid's room? You could even make some other basic objects like a bed. And how big is a bed? I don't know, Google it. Eighty-four by seventy-two. I don't know that. A twin XL. That sounds like what a kid would have. No, they would have a twin. They would have a twin. Yeah, twin XL. We'll say two meters long and one meter wide. Great. It's probably that tall. It's two meters long and maybe one meter wide. Maybe a little bit like that. Hey, congratulations! You have a bed.
As for these things, these can be like the walls of the room. How tall is the ceiling? In my drawing class, I used to ask this as a uh, attendance question on on the day where we studied perspective. Every student, I would say, "How tall is a cat? How tall is a door? How wide is a lane of the road?" And the reason is because a lot of these perspective things are now a question of scale. So you can just ask yourself, "How tall is this? How tall is that?" And you start getting a sense. I'm going to shear this. Trying to I think I have to do it from a specific thing. But basically what I'm trying to do Yeah, there we are. Oh. I'm trying to get that like cramped room look that you see in kids' rooms where like their room is tucked in against the attic. Yeah, that's great. And hey, let's check our reference. So there's one. Maybe this co alcove should actually come inward. When in doubt, just zoom around your reference bunch. So many kids' beds to look at. I still keep going back to that one. This one's pretty good. Yeah, see, like this stuff? I love that. It's so cramped and unpleasant. Exactly what teenagers need. Oh, that one's cool. You know, so maybe I will do it like that. And maybe that's where this kid's bed is. So, you know, just a little bit of modeling. I'm not, you know, doing anything crazy. I'll select this camera. But if you have, like, a small amount of 3D knowledge, you can give yourself something that is great for just a quick paint over. So how tall did we say that this person should be? About four feet tall, maybe three feet tall. If it's somebody, maybe it's like a fellow kid sitting on the bed or sitting on the floor. Why? I don't know. Yeah, let's give him a bunk bed. That'll teach that. That'll teach those kids. And you can keep going from there. Uh, but that's all I'm going to do because this is all I need for me to now start going into the camera. Again, uh, think about that millimeter problem. If I wanted this to explicitly be a, you can see here, a 36 millimeter. So if I wanted this to explicitly be um, two point perspective, I would make my focal length 18 millimeters, which I will. And you can start to see we get more of that like MTV Cribs feel as this room starts getting crunchier. Cramp more and more cramped, right? Maybe like a writing desk right here. And by the way, now you can actually go in and start modifying some of this stuff. So for instance, I could make this explicitly negative forty-five degrees. This zero and this 
uh, 90 degrees if I know that that's like something I was trying to figure out a cheat. Now, how would I figure out this diagonal if I was drawing a perspective grid? There is a way to do it. Do you want to do it? Probably not. So from here, I mean, it's just so tempting to make this into a 3D modeling tutorial, but I'm not going to. So I'm not even going to render this. Renders, renders are for dorks. I'm just going to snap it. Let me go to Photoshop and paste it in. So this would give me everything I need to start doing a paint over. And what's cool is like, what about that thing I mentioned of like, how how zoomed in do you want it? I can just uh, eyeball it from here. So there's another trick I would recommend is just do it. But let's say I wasn't that smart. I mean, maybe I'll use this for reference. Maybe I want to actually do this the correct way and actually fill this up with a grid and lines. And I'm going to go back to 90 degrees. Oh, weird. That text is readable now. So what's nice about this is I actually kind of prefer doing this, like physically drawing it, because obviously there's some benefits there. Uh, but hopefully that gives you some of the ideas necessary for this. So for instance, I could see here um, that I need something where like maybe that's like the wall here. And now I could use this to start. And at this stage, I'm just going to go crazy with the line tool. I'm not going to worry about it. Maybe I could set the opacity to like 50% and up the weight to two or three so that I can like build my ideas over and over a little bit more. So Herein lies the conundrum. Now we have established that this is a rectangle in space. But I know that I want to do some sort of um, interesting like rooftop thing where it goes off in the distance. So I could start making that cut. And like one way that you might want to do this is think about that wall as a secondary problem where given a direct square. This is the next thing that I do often, all the time is don't draw a grid. Solve it as a two-dimensional problem and then cheap. So like here it is, is like um, maybe this is the wall that I want. Like that's the slope of the roof or maybe something like that. If I was trying to be accurate to reality, maybe I measure that angle. Or maybe I do something like that. And now I have this thing where I'm starting to like use this line as my parallel to the roof idea, right? Again, by the way, Photoshop has a couple of tricks like vanishing point um, that you can look into to further do this. But I really love just trying to solve it the old fashioned way. So this is technically not that shape. It should be like that, right? And it's probably actually closer to based on this. Yeah, that's pretty good. So this is now like my window sill. I don't know how 
how you would do a window on this. Check your reference. Oh wait, that would be uh, the roof, right? So I don't think there would be a window there. Well, we can still do a, a 2D design problem now, which is, let's just start filling this up with a couple of rectangles that represent You know, maybe some cool teenage posters or something. Maybe this is like wall of friends pictures. Put one big thing here. Go oh, sports team. At this point, I'm doing something that I just like, which is going over here, grabbing posters, like this New Kids on the Block poster. You just put it up here. Whatever. Something like that, right? So you got this design, right? Now you know that it has to fit into that grid. So you can now, I like to just use uh, warp, not warp, distort. I guess distort. And if I put these four corners here, we got the wall of this kid's room. But also we can see uh, this angle going down here. Now, what a horrible perspective problem that is. And there is a way to solve it. Uh, but I think, like, at this point, just defer to this. So let's try and, like, get, get a little looser. Like, you know, do a bit of thought process. So I'm trying to think of, like, how that has some sort of roof angle. And now that is going to start going towards that. And what's cool about this is you start like getting very uncomfortable with like the idea of um, how aggressive perspective really is. But again, like just throwing some lines in there is a really great help. So for instance, like if I do something like that, I can start to see how this would go. And the other thing that is important to mention is that like up and down lines are very much your friend with a two dimensional problem like this. So at this point, like, um, there's going to be the bunk beds. And I have this measurement here, and I, I am going to start putting in a person for scale, which is, I'm going to say that this kid is, well, here's the problem. Like, uh, if this was a one-point uh, one perspective problem, it would be very easy to figure out the scale. Uh, but at the very least, we can use this idea that we have a horizon line, at least. So anything that goes through the horizon line or uh, is going to be the exact same. So, like, if I draw... Okay, and I said there was like maybe a kid sitting on the floor here. 
and that's how high up this is. I'm going to draw that person in. Cool emo hair. And they're sitting over here reading some sort of cool skater magazine. So a person sitting down like this is usually about um, three feet tall. And so this tells us something about how high, for instance, the bunk bed should be or how high this wall should be. So this is actually... So if there's a friend standing over here, and they're like crossing here, it's like about three people tall. One, two, three. So a bunk bed, if you're standing here, if you came out to here, that would be like one, two, three. So this bunk bed should actually be like right there. And that's really what you have to do a lot with these perspective things, is start thinking about it as like um, problems of um, scale. So like now I'm trying to draw like a ladder in here. So anything, like any sort of point, just measure from wherever you put it on the floor to the horizon, and that tells you how high up it is. So I think like one problem I have right now in this is, I think I made this like way too high up because like if that wall comes down to here, that's like one, two, three, four, five. So I think I have to take this and rethink it. Actually, like let's compare that over here. So again, where's my horizon? It's probably like right here. I think I see the problem. I now think that my problem is just that I need to take this floor down a little bit more. So let's actually, like, let's think through this. How tall would this corner be? Again, we can check reference. It's kind of handy to do that. Um, I would say that this room is probably about 8 feet tall and then 10 feet tall in the corner here. So let's say, like, this corner edge here is... 10 feet, and this one is 8 feet. Now let's go with 7 feet. I want it to have that like cramped feeling. So if that's 7 feet, how high, like, I think what I need to do is have this corner come down a little more so that I have something to work with. So if these kids are sitting here, just draw people everywhere. One, two, three. So I think the corner would have to start like there. All right, so if a person is here, oh, that seems about right. On two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you know, another thing I'm starting to feel like is maybe like the problem here is some of the stuff is a little too cramped. By the way, I frequently just erase, erase, erase. 
So I got my person. Two foot person. Two feet. Got my fellow person here. Six feet. Uh, my bunk bed should be about six feet tall too. So maybe that actually is like a little further over here. So like one, two, three, four, five, six. So if that's six feet, and the ceiling over here is ten feet tall, and that's like starting a little bit for the back. I'll just arbitrarily put that. So therefore that is six feet. Therefore this would be twelve feet. Therefore this would be about ten feet, right? Yeah, sure, Oscar. So there's my sort of corner. There's like where the bunk bed's going. And something like that. Yeah, that's starting to feel good. Now for the old frequent paint over trick. This is something I do all the time. I actually think like this is something where I wonder if like it started with teaching and then eventually evolved into a culture of improved per or, you know, it actually ended up becoming, like, industrial common practice to just do paint overs. Because, like, it teaches you a lot about just, like, letting your, your choices be a mess, you know. So now, we can start doing things like... Oh, there's a the door. Two, four, six, eight. That door is huge. Or it should be like that. Here we can see where that ceiling needs to go, which is we need this downward slope from like here to here, and from there to there. So there's sort of our ceiling, right? I think.
And this is going to be those like weird slant through windows. Because this is like the direction of the house pointiness. I just had to make a bunk bed for my kids. And yeah, that sucks. Want to wish it on my enemies. Now maybe like one problem with this is that especially when you compare it to the various reference I still don't feel like it feels cramped enough. And I think like part of this can be just solved with a crop. Maybe like uh, this is actually, you know what? This is actually, I'm doing this all wrong. Let's solve this using a different method, which is just a center object. So a lot of these beds start off with basically what is a straight single object. And so that is another really great way to do this, which is um, just start with one object and then force everything else to follow along. I think like for this, I'm going to move the ruler up a little. Texture. Screw it. Let's just have center composition. Super boring. Now again, let's establish some ground rules. How tall is a person? How tall is somebody in this room? Maybe there's some big guy over here sitting in a chair. Reading, and he is four feet tall. In other words, from here to this is always going to be four feet tall. How tall is a bed? Well, a bunk bed is approximately approximately six feet so I can start with just one center edge here and therefore four five six ish So what's cool is like if you start with a single object, I feel you know we've been drawing these like squares since we were kids, even if we're just eyeballing it, which I'm now feeling a lot more inclined towards. And to some extent, what's great is like it gives you the perspective right away, and then you can um, extrapolate the opposite from there. So, for instance, this uh, right here, six feet tall. Therefore, we need some sort of back edge. I don't know. Make this shorter. Now, what I hate is like um, figuring out depths with diagonals, or when you're doing two-point perspective. So usually, I just don't. There's ways you can do it, but you definitely get to the point where 
it's a waste of your time and it would be better served doing something that was a little more um, a little more automatic by the way what is that You know, there's a artist I really admire named Ian McKay, and he actually makes fun of drawing perspective grids. Like, you know, you should just be working on like how to eyeball it. And like, one thing I try to do is this like kinesthetic arm motion, where I try to draw using uh, my arm as much as possible. And as a result, you can draw a straighter line. And as a result, you don't need a grid for everything. So if I've extrapolated that and I found this back edge right here, boop, I can now say that that's six feet. Therefore, this is like an eight foot ceiling. I've not been in Photoshop in a while. This is wild shouldn't say that but it hasn't been like my my daily program in a while so having figured out that back edge here This is where the line tool is handy. By the way, uh, I highly recommend checking out Krita, which is kind of like Photoshop's tools here for perspective drawing, but way a million times better. So this guy is over here reading in the corner, which means we need some sort of like back wall here. Again, how tall is this desk? Well, if this guy's four feet, the desk is probably three feet. I'm sitting at a desk and yeah, maybe it's like two feet. Now nah, I'll say three feet. So that would make it from here to like right there. In other words, slightly shorter than the guy. And so with that, I get this point, which is kind of like right here, which means that right there is my eight foot ceiling. Yeah, that, that looks right to me. Now what can you do to like 
maybe vaguely help your sense of uh, positioning. Well, like something like this, I'll create a new layer. This bed is a good example. Um, let's switch to a nice red color. Maybe you can't solve everything, especially when it's um, the confounding problems of a two-dimensional grid. Oops. But at the very least, one thing I could solve is my center points. So I drag this out. That's kind of there. Now, what about this bed? Well, at the very least, if I can find out where the rectangle is, I can find out where the center of it is. Therefore, if I cut like this, especially with a really foreground object like this, this can be really handy for um, just making sure that this is really accurate. So maybe I don't have everything solved, but now when I go in, so that uh, low opacity, I can now go in and reasonably identify that maybe this kid's pillow, if he has like two pillows on the bed, there's pillow number one, and here's pillow number two. And I figured out kind of where they would be, you know. Why is this bed so neat and tidy? It should be a mess, right? Again, I'm not actually like doing any rendering here. Um, I'm mostly just trying to think through a perspective problem. So how do you go about rendering this is like the next stage. But like, you know, it's so worth it to put in the effort to make sure that this works well. By the way, if you want to see like a really fun example of that perspective trick, like put something super, super in the foreground, like, um, like a rug or something. Something so, something so in the foreground that like we can't even see one of the corners, right? But we could kind of extrapolate it. So it's probably like right around here. Does that look right? So imagine the this line here and this line here came down. Now I got a center line, which means that we could do something like divide it. Now, why would you do that? Well, now we can photo bash in this brilliant new kids on the block. Ooh, Jonathan, yeah. So what if we, he has some sort of new kids on the block rug? Why? I don't know. But I could very easily now distort it. I'll start by rotating it 180 degrees. And now I warp it. No, not warp. Distort. Distort's the best one. Always use distort. And this will theoretically be accurate to his room. So you could do this with other things like, um, I don't know, towels, wallpaper, all sorts of things, movie posters. Anyways, uh, these are just some of my preferred ways of like solving these problems. Um, how to actually like make it pretty is a much scarier proposition. 
But as far as getting the, the perspective right before you do anything, this is what I would do. So like having done that, I don't know, maybe I'll try rendering it now. I'm going to start by just cheating. Here's all my bedrooms. Do we have some sort of color theory here? I don't know. I'm just going to copy this. Look at all these nice colors. I'm going to open this in Photoshop. And on one hand, I'm going to use filter, blur, average. This will give me a mother color of what's the average color of teenage boys' filthy, disgusting rooms, right? Having chosen that color, let's fill this layer with that. Set it to multiply. So now I have some sort of, I don't know, starting color. I can also go back to that image. Where's my other Photoshop document? Do I have one that I really like? I do tend towards some of these like bluish ones. Manly colors. Ooh, shaving cream colors. I'm going to crop it to like this. And I like doing this. Sometimes filter. Filter going. So if you choose like palette knife, that'll essentially like rip it down into like the only colors that you're using yeah, didn't work Sorry, I'm in hockey hell. Something like that. Let's go with these ones. There we are. So now I got these colors, right? And that's what I'm going to cheat off of. Woo, cheating. Some of this stuff I can get in real fast. So for instance, at this point, I'm going to choose my favorite brush, which is hard round pressure size opacity flow. Let's start doing stuff. So like one thing I do right away, I think it's just a helpful thing to think about is get your lightest light and your darkest dark. My lightest light is going to be like a window. Like over here. So I flow to like 50%. Oh, I'm still on pencil. You soft. I hate the soft brush. You tell everyone I said that. I don't like that either.
You know what? Screw opacity and flow. I'm going to get like, right into it. I get like more and more brute forcey. Um, the older I get, I feel like with my painting. So there's like my lightest light. My darkest dark. Probably going to be stuff like under the bed here. And like even just that. Like already like there's some sense of lighting just off of that. Maybe some sort of wood colors for the bunk bed. Pew, 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 pew. And, you know, being that this is the arts, I think that I'm starting to feel like a a good time to abandon this, you know? Like, got just enough of a lay-in that it's time to move on to the next project that piques my interest. Uh, I should do something like that. My preferred way to paint is almost always now, like, I'm just doing it for me. Going like that. Of course, this is like, you know, just almost pure concepts, right? I'm not, like, thinking through a clean line drawing. I'm not, like, creating layers that have safe things. Like, this is a, this is a mess. But a mess is really fun a lot of the times. And like um, some of the stuff that we studied in painting class, like Munsell charts, like what I like about them is, you know, they do train you to like go for like the explicit, yes, this is the correct answer sort of color. trying to just get like this sense of a light of a light statement in as quickly as possible pew 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 again these sort of contact shadows under furniture and stuff They'll win you the whole day. So my theory is that 
Anyway, as I'm doing this, I'm just using like one thing at a time. But my theory is like something over here would probably have slightly more bleed. And I'll just like touch a color a little bit and then sample the mix of where it was and where it went. That's usually good enough for me. Let's maybe fill the ceiling in really fast. See, I select that light color way too much, right? So I select this floor color way too much. Switch brushes a little bit. Wait, did I lock the pixels on this? I just like to think about this. I'm trying to remember where my line was. So this wall is facing away from the window, and therefore it's going to be a little darker. I am personal preference, but be bold. Stick these in here, figure out the Details later. And then lastly, you know, you tangent. And over here, you come up and you write dark web. Typical child getting on the dark web. Anyways, I hope this gives you some, uh, some thought, food for thought, and other ways to go. And I don't even know if I'm still recording. Let's see. Hey, memory kept up. So, uh, you know. Far up. Bye.